Autism is a neurodevelopmental disorder with a strong genetic component. Yet the way it presents itself is an evolutionary puzzle. Autism is heritable, yet it often reduces reproductive success, which naturally would lead to the question, why hasn't natural selection phased out autism? If it has negative consequences, why does it still persist? The key lies in understanding where it comes from. Autism is a polygenic disorder, which means multiple genes contribute to its development. In polygenic conditions, genes involved in one trait may also play a role in the development of another trait. Take intelligence as an example. Genes linked to autism have also been shown to be linked to higher intelligence. And since intelligence is correlated with increased reproductive success, these autism-related genes could persist in the population as a byproduct. And at least for some time, that was the prevailing theory. But since then, two general theories were put forward to explain why autism exists. These are the extreme male brain theory and the reptile brain theory. The extreme male brain theory of autism suggests that individuals with autism exhibit an intense focus and are extremely capable at focusing on the accomplishment of a unique task, systematizing rather than empathizing. Systematizing involves analyzing variables in a system to better understand its results, whereas empathizing has more to do with social skills. On average, men are thought to have a more systematizing brain, demonstrating a greater interest in analytical tasks. And there is good support for this idea. For starters, autism is significantly more prevalent in males than it is in females, with a diagnosis rate of 3 to 1. Secondly, individuals with high-functioning autism, possessing average or above average IQs, consistently outperform neurotypical counterparts with the same IQ level in systematizing tasks. So think things like breaking down and analyzing data or software engineering. Thirdly, behavioral differences between individuals with and without autism are linked to anatomical differences in the brain. While exact differences are relative and unique in most individuals, it is globally recognized that the brain's outer layer seems to have a different pattern of thickness in people with and without autism. Lastly, there is a positive association between exposure to prenatal testosterone, specifically fetal testosterone, and the development of autistic traits, which altogether contribute to the hypothesis that autism is a result of a normal male brain shifting to an extreme to focus on the specific strengths associated with being male. From an evolutionary standpoint, it is theorized that men with well-developed systematizing skills and less emphasis on socializing may have enjoyed certain advantages. Early human societies were hunter-gatherer communities, and analytical skills can aid in crafting tools or weapons, as well as in activities such as tracking prey or trading. In this scenario, empathizing too much might even be a disadvantage, especially in a situation that would involve eliminating rivals. Therefore, having an extreme male brain, a characteristic strongly linked with autism, could have created practical advantages which would lead to its persistence in modern times. The reptile brain theory offers yet another perspective on the evolution of autism. According to this idea, mammals, particularly primates, have developed a brain organized into three basic layers. This is referred to as the triune brain model. Central to this model is the vagus nerve, a key component of the autonomic nervous system. In the initial layer, the unmyelinated vagus emerged, regulating behaviors like playing dead and avoiding conflict. These behaviors are common in reptiles, but unusual in mammals. In the second stage, the sympathetic adrenal system developed, preparing organisms for action in response to dangers. The third stage led to the emergence of the myelinated vagus, which plays a role in social communication and contributes to calming behaviors. This evolution reflects how the nervous system adapted to different challenges over time throughout our history. And the reptile brain theory proposes that individuals with autism tend to minimize the expression of the mammalian response in situations that involve social communication. Instead, they rely more on defensive strategies involving both moving and staying still. Individuals with autism have difficulty switching between states of action and participation in social interactions. This limitation could be more of an advantage though, as it helps emphasize focus on objects or things while simultaneously minimizing potentially challenging interactions with people. Having a nervous system geared towards defensive behaviors and facing challenges in social communication fall outside the typical range of social behavior. 
And the inability to calm the defensive system through social interactions leaves the nervous system in this perpetual state of hypervigilance. While this response is adaptive in reptiles, it can also be very damaging in mammals. But keep in mind, up until this point, these are just the prevailing theories. But there is one more. One more complete view that incorporates pieces of the puzzle from all the existing theories. Anime Plöger and Freistin Gallus put forth in 2011 the most comprehensive theory on the existence of autism I've seen. And this is it. Autism is known to be influenced by many genes, not just a single one, which we already discussed. And so far, there have been about 30 different genes linked to autism. If we consider this from an evolutionary perspective, it becomes vital to think about how these genes work together during development. This is known as epistatic interactions. Let's imagine there are 30 genes involved in both autism and intelligence. Since intelligence is linked to better chances of having children, these 30 genes related to autism might spread in the population because of their association with intelligence. In most cases, when these 30 genes interact, they result in individuals with high intelligence who do not have autism. However, in some cases, particularly when there's an association with maybe too much prenatal testosterone or spontaneous mutations, these gene interactions can lead to autism or other health issues. But while the unfortunate gene interactions causing autism are associated with lower survival and reproductive success, most of the time, these gene interactions actually increase fitness due to their high correlation with really high intelligence, making the genes related to autism beneficial in the right context. There is also a lot of evidence to support their theory. For starters, individuals with autism often demonstrate equal and even superior performance on certain intelligent tests compared to people without autism, even with similar IQ levels. And studies in autistic savants, so individuals who have extraordinary skills in one highly specific area, like for example math, show that autism is highly correlated with competence in a unique specific skill as autism often co-occurs with savant syndrome. But this made me wonder, can autism by itself prove advantageous? In this series on different neurological disorders analyzed through an evolutionary lens, we've touched on the idea that all traits fall within a spectrum, and no trait overemphasized is advantageous. So sure, being conscientious is generally an advantage, but if you're too conscientious, you might sacrifice too many opportunities in the present moment for a long-term gain that may never come, leading to a huge negative effect on fitness. In the same way, extreme forms of autism are not adaptive. But that doesn't mean that minor forms of autism are not adaptive. And I think the functioning form of autism could be a form of what we call high intelligence. Temple Grandin is an autistic woman who was born in 1947. When she was a child, she was extremely autistic and on the upper end of the spectrum of the disorder. But over time, as she aged, she was able to work herself out of it. She's relevant not only because of her awareness campaigns meant to help those with autism, but also because of what she achieved. As an animal behaviorist, she is credited with designing modern day slaughterhouses. And this she is credited to the way she thinks. Temple believes she thinks like an animal and redesigned slaughterhouses so when animals enter, they not only feel safe, but are treated humanely as well. As the author of over 60 scientific papers on animal behavior, she was able to thoroughly map out the neurological responses of various livestock in their environment to figure out what causes them distress and what causes them comfort. And she accomplished this through an understanding of icons. Icons are immediately recognizable, even without a good representation of what they are emulating. Think, for example, about a house. This is what most people would agree is what an icon for a house would look like. But it's not. It doesn't actually represent what a real house looks like. It's not a house. It's a generalized depiction of a house, which is not the same thing. Temple has stated many times when thinking about how something looks, she needs to think about something she's seen before. If I tell you again to picture a house, you're most likely going to picture the icon I brought up earlier. But in her case, she would have to picture a house that she's actually seen in person before, which means she's unable to average out a representation of a house in the form of an icon, and then use that icon as a representation for the average of all houses. She has to fixate on one specific house. Intelligence is a hard to explain phenomenon, and one of its basic purposes is to help us understand how to look at things in what level of complexity 
and in what level of abstraction. Our perception then is there to help us filter out the complexity of the world, abstract it and help us make a basic representation so to not overwhelm our senses. Which is why we often try to compress the complexity of the world into a simple representation that is easy to understand. We take a complex thing, average it out, make an icon out of it and represent it through a slogan or a word or a picture. And if I show you that picture, you understand the underlying complexity, which will help you understand the icon. Animals don't have this ability. And so if a cow is walking through a patch of farmland and stumbles upon something like a can of Coke, all of the animals will stop and just stare at this thing for hours, unsure of how to proceed. Temple is a brilliant woman, and she had similar problems generalizing concepts when she was younger, which helped her bridge the gap between how humans perceive and how animals perceive, allowing her to then design the slaughterhouses we still see all across the world today. I mean, the fact that she was able to bridge the gap in perception, to me, is nothing short of amazing. But it is also an example of another advantage of autism, attention to detail. A qualitative study conducted by Giddy Russell and colleagues in 2019 set out with the goal of mapping out whether or not autism had distinct advantages in the workforce. And something in particular caught my attention. Attention to detail and differences in perception. In the study, 28 interviews were carried out with autistic adults, basically asking them questions about what they do, what their interests are, their strengths, and so on. But in these questionnaires, two universal strengths were stated by all the interviewees. They were attention to detail and a noted difference in how they think. Attention to detail is a necessity if you want to be the best at anything. You essentially have to hyper-focus on the goal at hand for years at a time. As an example, it took Darwin 20 years after discovering evolution to thoroughly flesh out his ideas and publish his book on the origin of species, something that couldn't have been accomplished if he wasn't as obsessed with his ideas as he was. But I'm more interested in the difference in mental wiring statement made by these interviewees. One quick Google search will show you a list of some of the most prominent scientists of the past centuries. Notice something in particular. All of the greatest discoveries have come from people who are at least thought, because I'm, I'm not sure whether it's proven, to have autism. And yes, Charles Darwin is also on this list. If you take one thing away from this video, let it be this. Personality and differences in neural development can be thought of through the lens of evolution because it'll help us understand how to make the best out of our unique skill sets. If you have ADHD, for example, you would do best in an environment that lets you work on multiple things at the same time fully utilizing the novelty aspect of the DRD4 gene. I think autism can be a strength in the same way. Attention to detail, Saval syndrome characterized by exceptional ability in one highly specific domain, systemized based thinking, and high intelligence are all correlated with autism. Temple Grandin may have struggled pursuing something different, but because of her unique viewpoint, she was able to tackle and solve a complex problem no one before her could figure out. And so, Autistic individuals can make the best of their abilities by putting themselves in positions where they can make the most use of these skill sets. Something like chemistry or math or physics are a few that come to mind. Nikola Tesla, Charles Darwin, Isaac Newton, and even Albert Einstein all have documents suggesting they had some form of autism. Now, I would approach this with caution as I couldn't find any really hard evidence to back up this claim, but if it is true, it's a testament to how much of an advantage autism can really be.